What's up guys? Another edition of Scummy Unplugged, new studio, and a guest that I'm really happy to have on. You're my Recovery Today magazine partner, but I've never even met you. Today's oh, the first day. I know. I'm I feel like I've known you forever, even though we just met today. It's weird how that is in 2018, technology and just I, I don't know. You're just you know, you're very real, you're very authentic. I love that you're part of the magazine. I, I loved it when they kind of brought you in. I love that we're different generations and yet, you know, we have similar messages. I think it's so cool and yeah. uh I've read all your stuff in Recovery Today. Uh-huh. And how did you kind of fall? I don't even know your story. That's the thing. Uh, I know you over text messages. I read your story. But how did you get into the magazine? How did this all how start? How did it all come together? Well, I worked for Sober Recovery Center. I was a therapist and life coach. And I also was doing celebrity rehab with Dr. Drew Pinsky. So it was kind of happening at the same time. And that morphed into my first book, which is called The Law of Sobriety, Attracting Positive Energy for a Powerful Recovery. And Greg always saw in me, he's the owner of Sober Recovery, yeah. he always saw in me something I, I think special. And so eventually we kind of switched up my job from being a therapist and life coach um, at Soba to starting this magazine um, with his brother. He um, knew that I was a journalism major. He knew that I wrote a book. He knew that I'd been on television. And I think Greg has a brilliance, as you know, for delegating things or finding people uh, where their magic is. For instance, you know, you've become a really great host. That was, he, he probably saw something in you and knew that you had magic there. So I think he believed in me. And so I came in together with Rob. I'm the one that brings in a lot of the content, although Rob does too. Rob is more like the techno guy. I'm more sort of the content guy. We both do some interviewing. You brought on a lot of amazing guests. I think Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah. Russell Brand. I mean, yeah, how do I you have, just I have. over um, the years? I think because of being on television, being because I was on Celebrity Rehab, I think people... Um, are open to my emails, you know, when I yeah. write them and say, look, we have this magazine of hope and inspiration. I was on Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew. I was the go-to expert. I think that helps when you have this sort of brand, even though I'm not like a celebrity per se. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I have my way. I have my sources. I'm very persistent. I don't give up. It took me probably six to nine, well, God, no, six to nine months to get um, Russell Brand. And then Jamie Lee Curtis, it probably took three years. I mean, I wow. just don't give up. I mean, my next one is Stevie Nicks. Like, I am going to get I've Stevie heard about Nicks. That. I'm pretty sure I you're going to get him. Too. I, I, I'm going to get her. that's Fleetwood Mac. Probably different generation. You know who Stevie? Yeah, is. of course. Yeah, I mean, have to get her. That's on. huge. That's yeah, huge. that that will be exciting. How was celebrity rehab? So were you were, were you like a therapist in other rehabs before you were? On yes, M yes, I was. I was. I've been doing this since 2005. I worked for Promises, which was one of the first residential home st type rehabs yeah. before they started booming. This is where you know Robert Downey Jr. went and a lot of the celebrities. And um, through that. I met Dr. Drew. I started doing his radio show. I was sort of the life coach of the month. And I saw Celebrity Rehab one, and I'm like, I'm going to be on his next one. I completely That's used crazy. the law of attraction, and I'm like, I'm going to be on your next show. And I, I, I was. I was on for the next three years. I was behind the scenes a lot. I was on. They always filmed everything, and I probably aired four times. I remember seeing you. That's crazy. Really? Yes. Because that, that, I didn't air that much, but if you go on the VH1 vlog, you know, you'll see some of my... Um, I wouldn't call them outtakes, but things that never made it to air. Yeah. But they needed somebody kind of behind the scenes to, to meet with these clients because they were char they were charged up. They were like engaged in group and they were in a rehab and it was real recovery and, and they, they needed that extra support. Do they always come out? Like, I don't, I feel like they wouldn't come out all the way like in front of camera. That's got to be a lot to have a camera no, they you did. They did. It was very natural. I never even noticed the camera. Just like right now, yeah, I didn't yeah. notice the camera. I only notice the camera when I'm talking to a camera. Like if I'm going to do it, my right own video then I notice it but if I'm just sort of engaged I'm in I'm in the, the zone I'm in, in the, the flow and so were the clients it was real rehab um some some of them passed away later of their drug overdoses that uh, subby rehab got some flack but what I say is that whatever percentage passed away from subby rehab is the same percentage that we, that die out there in in in, in the recovery world, in the world of I, addiction. I personally feel that was so good. It brought like eyes to the the problem. Right. I don't think there's enough of that. I think you know that. Greg knows that. That's why the magazine is great. We what need is, different paths. We need to have answer? an opening. We have to have an opening. And that show was an opening. Some people didn't even know what rehab looked like. Yeah. 100%. You know, so I ignored the naysayers because there were naysayers that said, oh my God, recovery should be anonymous. How can you put it on television? 
you know, we have a lot of young people like yourself, even younger millennials, what do you call millennials in the 20s? Millennials, yeah. They are looking for other types of paths. You know, they're not just wanting one path. I don't know what your feeling is about higher power God. There are, there are even those that don't even necessarily believe in a God or higher power. They, they're looking for other ways to get sober. And we have to open it up to everybody. We have to allow it all to be there, although I believe the 12 steps are the foundation. Yeah. In my opinion, that is where you, you I think that's the best place to start. I know that show helped me. Um, I didn't know, like you, you get this vision of like what a rehab is, even meetings, like it's dark, the lights are on you, you're Everybody's in a small smoking circle, cigarettes but and I eating remember donuts. I watched that show and when I was going to rehab, when my father was driving me, I was like, it was the gnarliest feeling for anybody going to rehab. It's the scariest day of your life. And I just remember seeing that show. I'm like, dude, it was when I was in rehab, it was the best experience of my life. I got my life back. It, I had so much fun. I listened to the counselors and I don't know. I'm just well, you trying were to open. let more. I'm you were not, open and willing and you were ready. Yeah, and it's coming. good. Yeah, yeah. And it's good to like let people know like it's not bad if you end up in rehab. You, you know, it's it's a scary thing to admit like it's time for rehab. You were ready. I mean, you know, in my opinion, it it, it does I, matter where you go, but you also have to be ready. And if you're not ready, I mean, my ex-husband probably has been to 25 rehabs and they ne- they ne- they kept him sober for a minute. It was he just wasn't ready. He was kind of doing it just like Sam doing it, get doing the- it for her, doing it for him, doing it for the job. But it really has to you know be it, you have to be ready and willing and open, as they say. It's sad. I mean, you're you're the professional. I you know the stuff I do. I'm just saying my story, so I'm learning from you. But what do you tell somebody when they come up to you and like I have a problem? I haven't talked to anybody. Like, what do I do? And I usually you know I tell them about my rehab. Like go to rehab is that the only answer i mean i well, feel I mean, it is well i mean i mean the, they can go to therapy they can find spiritual solution they can go to yeah. their church or temple the thing, synagogue so many different. they can do yoga and recovery buddhism and recovery they can i mean there's so many i mean even just watching your you know youtuber or, or your podcast listening to your podcast yeah. can be their path you know what we learn as professionals is we start where the client is like where are you at yeah. if somebody isn't willing to go to meetings then we kind of maybe gear them just to some other path and hope that they make it to the meetings or if someone's not ready for rehab i might recommend a book or something for them to look at to sort of uh you know, get so started. It's probably better to come like a therapist like you to kind of weed out what this person needs or what he doesn't I need. I think we both have something to offer, Scummy. I think someone who has been there has a yeah. lot to offer. And on the other the other part of this is I was married to an alcoholic, so I my mother's an alcoholic, so I do understand the disease. And then I being a love addict and codependent, I do understand what it feels like to be so empty inside that I will do anything to to get something on the outside to fill me up. Yeah. And I think we all that's really what addiction is, is, is that unmanageable feeling inside. A hundred percent. It's just, the dis-ease, right? It's hard because there's so many different like ways you can go about it. And, you know, for me, rehab, it was like, I just need to be trapped away for 30 days. And like this heroin, like that's like, I feel like the only way you can do it. Like it, it just takes over your life. And that's, what's really going on right now. I agree. The opiates that, and like that yeah. feeling I'm telling when you're coming out, it's like, I can go get a sack really quick and make it feel better or I got to go through hell to like even sobriety so up there it's you needed the protected environment what's sad is people aren't getting long-term recovery I mean that was that was you know that's long term like you know being in a rehab for 90 days six months a year I mean I I know that's how it used to be and insurance used to pay for that now it really doesn't work that way and it's really sad it's because people need that they they, need that contained environment they do I know like 90 days was so much going in there is that what you had 90 days I I did 30 you did 30 it was cheaper like on my end for insurance whatever but after rehab I stayed in a sober living you know I wanted to I wanted to be there so luckily I I just was in that way of mind you took direction but I feel 30 days if I went home it's uh it's like you got to relive you got to relearn everything in your life change everything make new friends do everything different and the same is with other diseases you know when I divorced the addict alcoholic in my life I had to change everything I had to come up you know with um new new I I wouldn't say new friends but I joined a 12-step program Al-Anon I took up canoeing I um you know, re-upped my career. I dove, diver, diver. I dove. I 
dove deeper into the laws of attraction. I had to do everything I needed to do to change my mindset because I was really addicted to the addict alcoholic. That was my obsession was to get him sober. And my sickness was physical too. I had shingles. I had a staph infection. I uh, started losing hair. I, um, God, what else? I shingles. I think I said that. Um, wow. Uh, kidney stones. All these things started happening to me because I was neglecting myself. I wasn't. There was no self care. I was focused on you, getting you better, and ra- instead of taking care of myself. And I share this story because even though I'm a therapist and I'm licensed, we can struggle too. You know, we're human too. A hundred percent. I don't think a, a lot of people think about that. No, they. they, they uh, I don't. I mean, I'm. I'm listening right now. Well, I don't want to be up there and have my clients down here. Yeah. I want to co-create. I want to have a relationship, and a you've connection. Kind of been there, and you like. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's amazing. So, the book. When did you do this? This was my my book after the last divorce. It's the marriage and relationship junkie, and it's my story. I've been married multiple times, and I'm a codependent, a love addict, relationship addict, and I really wanted to eradicate the stigma about having multiple relationships, multiple failed marriages, because yeah. there was a lot of shame, just like there's shame in your addiction, there's shame in my addiction. I, it's very embarrassing to go out there in the world and say, oh, I've been married four times. People go, what's wrong with you? You know, and it's, sure, I had a really bad picker, but I had early trauma. I had a very traumatic um, birth. I was premature, I was in an incubator for three months. My mother did not hold, touch, nurture. I had no bonding early wow. attachment and what we know about early attachment is that is so important and so I was set up to be a love addict from the beginning constantly looking for connection the connection I never got in those early years That's so crazy. That's I know when really people like, hear that they're like wow but I want people to know that addiction you just don't wake up yes you can have the genetic predisposition to be an addict but there are reasons that we feel empty there are reasons that we feel uh, that lack of connection. There are reasons that we look outside of ourselves. So what was it in our lives that was missing? And that's that's my mission is to like, let's figure it out. Let's do the trauma work and let's find purpose. I think and let's I need get to well. talk to you after this because even <laughs> like when I was in rehab, I'm like, I, right now I forget the cameras are on us, but I, when I was in rehab, I didn't have, I don't know how I became an addict. I, I really like, did you have parents or family that were perfect addicts? Family. Perfect. No, they weren't. My dad, Vietnam, he was a cop. My mom, good. I don't know. It's like. Ah, Vietnam. Your dad had PTSD. No. He was in that Marine. He was a first Marine division. He was in the thick of it. No, like. So there were no. We have the best relationships. I'm telling wow. you, like, I, when this dirt bike thing came out and I just got so invested in the lifestyle, the fast lifestyle, then I became good at it. I was not paying for anything. Everything was coming to me, and it was like a fake life of just being of a professional extreme athlete, traveling, partying, and then breaking bones. Everything started adding up, adding up, losing everything good. So. Well, so then you started probably taking painkillers because you were yeah. having pain. You didn't just go to heroin. They I didn't, were- but like partying, I could tell like the first time I smoked weed, like I could just tell I was always going bigger and bigger. And even uh-huh. on my riding, going like doing these... 200 foot jumps is bigger the life the, what I was doing for a living was big so it felt so like so it's oh. interesting because you don't have a history of trauma and it was weird in there, rehab. It, and, and there were no grandparents there was no there has to be some addiction somewhere I don't know but like even in rehab they're always like getting like making me do all these papers and I really like you couldn't I couldn't really relate and you know so it's well, then maybe it's just simply I, lo- you know, I, I, you love drugs. Yeah. Like, it's just that simple. Like, maybe, maybe it's just that but simple. But I don't know. My parents got divorced. I, we don't have to, like, uh, so, yeah, maybe. Uh, there was a little trauma. There was. Then. So there's, like, a little bit, but still, I don't think, I don't know. It's, you know, trauma is basically energy trapped in your body from something that's happened in your life. And, I mean, it could be divorce, could be death, it could be tsunami, earthquake, it be like- fire. It could, it could be... It could have been, you know, maybe something occurred. The, the thing is with addiction is like, it's not just what you think, like you're gangbanger. You're like, you're told it's everybody. Anybody, I, anybody. You know, and that's why I'm just trying to talk as much about it. And like with your stories, I just feel like going out there, just telling people it's okay. Right. It's a big one. It can be anyone. That's a big one. You're yeah. like a shell and like you're in that addiction. Like you feel so breakable. Like it's hard for you to go out and just go say, I need help right now or like, you know, they well, when you're in it, you can't. You can't. You're, you're, you're br- same with relationship addiction. When you're it, in that obsession, all about the same it, you're addiction. all consumed. You're and all I, consumed. I think like your story is amazing, and like everything you're doing, like I've learned a lot. I'm, I'm happy 
we finally got to interview you because I scummy. always see all your interviews and they're oh. amazing. Like just your whole Thank story. You. I mean, Thank it's you. really. I hope I make a difference, you know, for one person. You are. You know, that's that's the whole thing. It's that's just to what make it is. But like, you know, you are. And I think it's just good. Just carrying that message. And uh, I had this was a good interview. So thank you. I guess we're out. Thank you okay. very much. Hug. I do we'll, hug. Get, we'll do a hug. Okay. <laughs> thank you, scummy. We're out. That was Bye. a great interview. I don't know what else to say. We're out. <laughs>